All right, so we'll get started here. Um, welcome everybody. We are here for another New York State adult use cannabis regulations read through. Um, in case you're keeping track, I'm sure someone out there is, uh, we're under 40 days left for the, the comment period. Um, so we've created this platform to review and in turn help shape comments regarding the proposed regulations for adult use cannabis in New York State. This programming is brought to you by CANI, the Cannabis Association of New York, and in partnership with the Rochester Public Library. And we've created this on the foundation and belief that you know, accessibility information is essential and a uh, foundational requirement for an equitable uh, industry. So we are picking up where we left off, uh, where we'll be on page 130 today as we're finishing up the cultivation rules and regs, and then beginning to review and explore uh, the rules and regs pertaining to processors. Um, today, I'm joined by my colleague, Jason Klimek. I'll allow him to introduce himself, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Thanks, Zach. Um, I'm Jason Klimek. I am the chair of the policy, Association, uh, policy committee for the Canvas Association of New York as well as the chair of the tax committee for the New York State Bar Association's Committee on Cannabis Law and the leader of the cannabis practice at Barclay Damon. Great. And I am the chair of the education committee at Canny, as well as uh, someone who sits on the committee for policy uh, alongside underneath Jason and working with Rochester Public Library and helping building out educational content programming there. Uh, also a small business owner and interested in the space. So I bring kind of experience and perspective from cultivator brand business that creates a, hopefully a good perspective here. Um, so again, folks who are live on the chat or live on the call, feel free to drop comments, questions, concerns in the chat, the Q&A. We'll address them on the fly as we go. Um, and folks recording or watching the recording, we hope this is uh, something that supports you in, your, in all your endeavors. Um, so we are picking up on page 130 of the proposed regulations, um, and we've been just looking into like the do's and don'ts of what cultivators can and cannot do. So we're kind of at the tail end of the, the prohibitions, let's say, um, where we're looking at, you know, all the requirements for tracking and like pesticide application, regenerative practices, um, and we're we're now in the in that kind of last page where a cultivator shall it's like so we're we're, we're picking up what cultivators shall do um you know the, one of the last things you said is a cultivator shall adopt and use an additional energy management practice as determined by the board um a cultivator growing cannabis indoors or in mixed light cultivation facilities shall provide the following annually or upon request so let me just share my screen here All right, so picking up here. Um, so a cultivator growing cannabis indoors or in a mixed light cultivation facility shall provide the following annually or to the office upon request. Uh, one, an energy consumption by source. So monthly, including consumption and demand. Uh, water consumption, which is gallons per month. On-site generation, monthly. Cannabis yield by dry weight annual for the previous 12 months and for each 12 months of the 12 month period and uh, any other information determined by the office to assist with energy usage benchmarking. Uh, cultivators shall use a resource manager to audit and track energy consumption metrics as approved by the office and report utility and energy bills together with cannabis yield and data to the office. Does it, Zach, does it look like that outdoor cultivators don't have to report water consumption? Um, it is something that needs to be reported in the annual report as stated in like the, the, the rules and regs pertaining to AUCC. So currently uh, our annual report has to include that information, but this makes it seem like outdoor cultivators are not uh, required to do this on the monthly basis, as I would argue that indoor and mixed light may have to be. So that's a great question. Uh, four, certain low energy buildings or, or portions thereof separated from the remainder of the building by thermal envelope assemblies complying with the section may be exempt from the building thermal envelope requirements set forth by office. Uh, lighting and HVAC use for indoor cannabis cultivation shall comply with all compliance requirements set forth by the board and set forth in part 125 of this title and any other requirements of the office. 
Um, a cultivator shall ensure the drying and minimal processing activities comport with the following requirements that any drying or minimal processing areas are clean, well ventilated, and free from condensation, sewage, dust, dirt, toxic chemicals, or other contaminants. Um, all buildings shall provide adequate environmental controls to ensure product protection and be of adequate size to properly dry the volume of cannabis produced. Um, photos or diagrams of drying or processing areas to be used for all product drying, minimal processing, and curing shall be provided to the office in the cultivator site plan and as required for part 125 of this title and notes on proposed staggered harvest and harvest window shall be provided to the office in the annual cultivation report. Uh, J, cultivation types and tiers. Um, a, cultivation may, a cultivator may operate only in the canopy tier, which is authorized to operate pursuant to this license. Now I'm curious here, Jason, like, do you interpret that as like, let's just say someone has to scale back for one quarter of their operation, like uh, literally a, a quarter, like Q1 or Q2. Um, are they breaking the rules if they're below their canopy tier? I think technically, because when you look at the tiers, it sets the minimum and maximum. It doesn't say, you know, the maximum or less. Mm. Um, but there is, and I can't remember if we've gotten to it or will get to it, but there's that provision on renewal um, where if you didn't grow, I think it was 80% of your canopy space within the last six months before renewal will drop you down. So wasn't that based on sales actually, or was it on the actual canopy of growth? I, I interpret that as like, you have to, upon renewal, you have to prove that you've sold 80% of that, which you produced in the past 12 months. Yeah. With, yeah. Something of that nature within six months of it being harvested. Um, that's, that's definitely something to circle back on to. Um, all right, cool. Uh, annual report. So an, annual cultivation report. A cultivator shall submit to the office in a manner or in format determined by the office an annual cultivation report, including but not limited to. Oh, there's a typo, little S right there. Um, one, data related to tracking all seeds, clones, or other plant material used, which shall include, but not limited to the source of the seeds, clones, or other plant material as determined by the office. Uh, detailed plant protection products, application records for any propagation treatments. Um, an agricultural input list that includes all the agricultural inputs used or to be used on the cultivation of cannabis. Um, facility energy report as required in subdivision C of the section 125.1 of this title. Five, records of scouting or monitoring cannabis for pests and disease. That's your IPM, your in integrated pest management. Uh, records for plant irrigation detailing the timing and appropriateness to the site and cultivation methodologies, including total water use per cultivation cycle. If applicable, records of water reuse, catchment, and other conservation practices. Uh, if applicable, records of regular maintenance and calibration of irrigation equipment. Um, Records of cultivation water analysis that includes a microbiological analysis detailing total coliform present. Such water analysis shall be tested by an environmental laboratory certified by the New York State Department of Health. Annual test results for all water used in cultivation other than water used for drip irrigation and subsurface irrigation shall indicate levels that are consistent with 10 NYCRR subpart 5-1. So, subsurface or drip isn't this is it really sounds like they're talking about water that could hit your plants um, versus water that's being fed through the ground uh, post cultivation water analysis results if there is any water runoff or discharge as part of the cannabis cultivation and any other information provided all right so that summarizes the operations for cultivation Again, if you're just jumping on now, our, our previous recording covered the first part of that. And now we're getting ready to dive into part 123.5, processor ownership, interest, business authorization, and prohibitions. Uh, Jason, you want to take this one? Sure. All right. A processor may acquire, possess, process, and sell cannabis from a licensed cultivator to a duly licensed processors or distributors. Authorized processing activities vary by the processing license type. 
A processor may process cannabis grown by a cultivator without taking ownership over that cannabis. A processor may only enter into a branding or white labeling agreements with its true parties of interest or another licensee, provided that such licensee is not otherwise prohibited therefrom pursuant to this chapter. A processor may hold one distributor license. A processor shall only conduct those activities specified on its application, <clears throat> whether on an initial or amendment application that have been approved by the office or board for such processor. A processor or its true party of interest may be a true party of interest in a cultivator, distributor, cooperative, micro business, or ROND. I also find the, the micro business one kind of interesting um, because because uh, the regs say that they can be a the TPI, cultivators and processors can be TPIs in a micro business, but um, that would seem to kind of violate the whole crossing the tiers thing under the statute. So I think that I think that's an interesting inclusion. And particularly like on the cultivator side, maybe there's not going to be undue influence, but considering that micro businesses can send out for processing. Um, it seems like there could be an undue influence aspect there. So I think it's mm. that's interesting and considering it's kind of contrary to the statute. I don't, I don't really understand how that got in there. Mm. Um, <clears throat> all right. A processor or its true party of interest may be a landlord, financier, or a goods and services provider to an adult use cultivator, processor, distributor, cooperative, micro business, or ROND license subject to all restrictions governing such relationships, including, but not limited to, undue influence, control, and true party of interest requirements. In addition to any other restrictions or prohibitions in this chapter, including, but not limited to, Part 124 of this title, no processor or its true party of interest is permitted to have any direct or indirect interest, including, but not limited to, being a true party of interest, passive investor, landlord, financier, or management services provider to a retail dispensary, on-site consumption, delivery, ROD, registered organization, or cannabis laboratory licensee or permittee. Also interesting there, retail dispensary. So does licensee at the end of that sentence apply to all of those different things that they just listed, or is it just the cannabis laboratory? Laboratory licensee, um, yeah. Very because retail dispensary could describe both. It could be a literal retail dispensary location or a retail dispensary licensee. Um, so again, this this tiers thing we're we're seeing it's it's difficult when you're trying to make regulations around it. Hmm. A conditional processor licensed pursuant pursuant to section 69A of the cannabis law is subject to all the rules and regulations in this title applicable to a processor. Such a conditional processor determined to be in good standing by the office shall, upon submitting any necessary forms required by the office and upon payment of applicable fees, be permitted to transition to a full processor license. A conditional processor shall be given priority by the office in review of its application for a full processor or distributor license under this part. Processor license facility operations, good manufacturing practices. All cannabis and cannabis product processing shall be in accordance with good manufacturing practice standards pursuant to either part 111 or part 117 of title 21 of the code of federal regulations as applicable for the type of cannabis or cannabis product being processed or as otherwise determined by the office. A licensee who is authorized to conduct certain processing activities as determined by the office shall establish compliance with GMP standards by submitting to the office proof of a qualified third party GMP audit of the licensee's extraction and or manufacturing processes as applicable to the satisfaction of the office within one year of commencing licensed operations. The office shall determine and authorize qualified GMP auditors. So that's interesting to me because it appears that you don't have to have the GMP audit before issuing, getting issued a provisional license, mm -hmm. which is not the way it is in hemp. In hemp, they want the GMP audit before they'll issue you your license and you can start. Literally, I think that the regs say before you start operations, you need to have a GMP audit. Yeah, I think there's been some pushback on this one that it's, it's inconsistent. And so essentially you're saying like someone could operate for a full year without GMP doing production, which like it kind of is counterintuitive to all the, the preliminary kind of and preparatory work to make sure things are in alignment with GMP. So yeah. we'll see if that stays the same. 
A licensee who is processing and required by the office shall maintain proof of current GMP certification for the duration of the license and make such certification readily available to the office upon request. General requirements. A processor shall maintain all designated processing areas in accordance with general sanitary, sanitary practices as set forth in section 125.6 of this title. Assign a lot unique identifier and batch number on all cannabis and cannabis products, which allow for complete traceability of all cannabis and cannabis products processed during a specific period of time and under similar conditions. Comply with all packaging and labeling standards in part 128 of this title. Maintain processing, packaging, labeling, and production batch records, including records of all ingredients and materials used in the processing of each lot of cannabis or cannabis product, and any other applicable records required by Part 125 of this title. Develop and maintain written standard operating procedures for all processing activities to ensure homogeneity and consistency of cannabis products, including, but not limited to, development of a master manufacturing record containing standards for product purity, strength, and composition for each type of cannabis product produced. Common plans, common plan types include a GMP plan, quality assurance plan, or hazard analysis and critical control point plan. Now, just a quick question, your, your legal perspective, a written standard operating agreement, like written, okay, computer, it can be digital. It doesn't need to be printed. You know, like, is there, is there anything you deduce from that besides like, it just has to be composed? No, I mean, I think that the, their, their, their point there is that they don't want you to just have some plan that you kind of orally communicate to people and that's mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. They want yeah. some record of it. And probably, you know, best practices is the people who are doing that kind of thing, you know, get a copy of the plan and have to sign that they received it or something like that, just to ensure that, you know, they've received it and looked at it. Yeah, cool. Appreciate that. Uh, all right. Requirements for extraction. Unless otherwise approved in writing by the office, a processor authorized to perform extraction may only use methods, equipments, solvents, gases, and mediums set forth in this section and approved on the processor's application and must be conducted only in a manner exhibiting minimal potential for human health-related toxicity. All extraction processes and activities shall be conducted by employees trained in the operation of the extraction equipment to be utilized, as well as the emergency plan for incidents, again, having them sign the, the SOP, probably a good thing. Um, mm demonstrate control of all sources of ignition and occur in a spark-free environment where appropriate for the type of extraction method used, ensure proper ventilation, have ongoing equipment monitoring, and maintain a record of regular maintenance of equipment based on equipment specifications, follow all applicable fire, safety, and building codes, regulations, laws, and guidance in the use and storage of solvents, including but not limited to maximum quantities to be held on site, and have evidence of the purity of any chemical solvents used and make any certificate of analysis or other documentation evidencing such purity readily available to employees and to the office upon request. Unless a processor obtains prior written approval from the office, extraction shall only be conducted using the following methods. Mechanical extraction methods, a professional grade closed loop CO2 extraction system, that is of a supply equivalent to food or beverage grade of at least 99.5% purity. Ethanol or alcohol based provided that all ethanol or alcohol shall be of a grade that meets or exceeds specifications of official compendiums as defined in section 321 of title 21 of the United States code. A volatile solvent or hydrocarbon extraction method provided that the method utilizes a commercial professional grade closed loop system designed to recover the solvent, utilizes the following permissible volatile solvent based or hydrocarbon extraction substances, which shall be accompanied by a certificate of analysis, which establishes that the substance have a minimum purity level of 99%. Butane, propane, or a different volatile solvent or hydrocarbon with prior written approval by the office prior to use. Now, Jason, um... The solvent, so just that, that paragraph B, utilize the following permissible volatile solvent-based hydrocarbon or hydrocarbon extraction substances, which will be accompanied by a certificate analysis, which establishes that the substances uh, have minimum purity level of 99%. So it's saying you need a COA for your butane, your, your propane, et cetera. That's, that's how I read it, yeah. Cool. 
I wonder how common that is. I don't have experience in sourcing that. Uh, besides, like I imagine something like on a label, for example, but uh, you know, sourcing the COA is just a curious thing. That's a good point. I don't know if COAs are regularly produced or it's just like you said, kind of right on the label. Mm. Um, all right. For all proposed volatile solvent based or hydrocarbon extraction, a processor shall submit to the office prior to receiving approval to commence extraction operations at a process processing facility documentation which demonstrates to the satisfaction of the office the following additional requirements for all designated extraction equipment rooms or other areas where volatile solvents used for extraction are handled or stored final certification letter from a licensed professional engineer or registered architect which certifies the completed installation of a professionally designed commercially manufactured extraction system that is compliant with all applicable state or local fire safety or building codes a letter from the municipal jurisdiction's fire marshal or their designee stating that a final inspection of the facility has been conducted and that the processor has demonstrated compliance with all applicable fire codes and or regulations. And a certificate of occupancy or equivalent document from the local building official that all permits for extraction related rooms or areas have been closed as applicable. Allowable cannabis and cannabis product types. A processor may produce the following types of cannabis or cannabis products for sale. Topicals, edibles that are not in the shape considered to be attracted to individuals under 21 as defined in part 128 of this title, including but not limited to capsules, beverages, tablets, tinctures, baked goods, gummies, or chocolates. So no Flintstone shaped edibles. Sorry. Guys. <laughs> uh, vapor, uh, vaporization cartridges or single use pens concentrates such as shatters, waxes, and resin, cannabis flower products, including but not limited to whole flour, ground flour, shake, and pre-rolls, cannabis extracts for intermediary sale, and any other cannabis... Uh, what, what's, what's that mean? Like I think to sell uh, to another processor or manufacturer? Right. Like they could extract the oil for somebody who doesn't have an extraction license, but has a manufacturer or doesn't have the extraction type processing license, just has a manufacturing type processing license so that they could add that oil to edibles. Mm. Call it. Great. Um, all right. Any other cannabis product or type or form, except for the prohibitions in subdivision E of this section with, with prior written approval of the office, which following written submission by the processor and a review by the office of the proposal, including but not limited to review of proposed manufacturing processes, methods of administration, and any other factors which assess risk to public health and safety is determined in writing by the office to be suitable as a product for retail adult use sale. Prohibitions and pro prohibited product types. A processor is prohibited from processing any cannabis, cannabis product which contain liquor, wine, beer, cider, or meet the definition of an alcoholic beverage as defined in section three of the alcoholic beverage control law, contain tobacco or nicotine, exceed the maximum total THC per serving per package limits set forth in this part, are attractive to individuals under 21 years of age as set forth in part 128 and 129 of this title, contain synthetic cannabinoids as defined in subdivision G and subdivision H of schedule one of section 3306 of the public health law. And I was just reading some comments today to the packaging and labeling regs. These were the comments um, by the office. They were the response comments to public comments. And they specifically said right in there that other than small amounts, which I take to mean basically like naturally occurring amounts, Delta eight, Delta 10, THCO, those ones were specifically said, but I would assume any other type of um, cannabinoid that would be boosted to an artificial level is a synthetic cannabinoid under the um, under subdivision G of Schedule I of Section 3306 of the Public Health Law. So OCM has said in those public comments that those are synthetic cannabinoids and are illegal. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because the next thing is contain any artificially derived phytocannabinoids. And a lot of the like Delta 8, the THC, V, whatever, O, you know, a lot of them are derived like 
from a, man, a, a chemical process that's exposing CBD, like let's say hemp derived CBD, which is a phytocannabinoid, a plant derived cannabinoid, exposing it to some kind of acid that then converts it into Delta eight, for example. So I'd say not only is it called, they're calling it synthetic above, but then also like artificially derived, like I'm curious exactly what they mean by that, because it seems to mean, uh, you know, phyto, phyto cannab So there's the synthetic cannabinoids, the ones that are purely manufactured. And then there's the next step is like those which have been adjusted or tinkered with that are derived from the plant. So it's, it's interesting. It seems like they're just trying to cover all their bases there. Like basically whether you convert something from, you know, a naturally occurring cannabis, or you basically create it in a lab. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like they're just trying to say everything that's kind of not Delta nine. <laughs> Um, uh, all right. require manufacturing under sterile conditions are considered a potentially hazardous food as defined by 10 NYCRR section 14-1.31 contain any non-phytocannabinoid ingredient that would increase potency, toxicity, or addictive potential, or that would create an unsafe combination known or unknown with other psychoactive substances. This prohibition shall not apply to products containing naturally occurring caffeine, such as coffee, tea, or chocolate. Any manufacturer are manufactured by application of phytocannabinoid concentrate or extract to commercially available candy or snack food items without further processing of the product. So does this mean just like you put it a sprinkle on top kind of thing and it's not actually formally manufactured it's just like an additive uh, i yeah i think that's exactly what it's getting at mm. uh all right commercially available candy or snack food items may be used as ingredients in a cannabis product provided that they are used in a way that renders them unrecognizable as the commercially available items and the label including the ingredients list does not note the final cannabis product contains the commercially available item that is probably <laughs> in there for like intellectual property reasons um okay. more than like anything um mm -hmm. i think the office wants to be very clear that they do not support or condone adulterating otherwise legal products and turning them in because you know there's been it's been kind of famous for uh like skittles going after um companies producing things that look like Skittles and things like that. So I think they're just wholly mm. trying to avoid that. Mm. Um, are in the shape of or imprinted with the shape, either realistic or character of a human being, animal, insect, or fruit, or is otherwise attractive to individuals under the age of 21, as defined in part 28 of this title, or are in the form of an injectable inhaler, suppository, transdermal formulations, or any other disallowed form as determined by the office, including a form solely allowed solely for medical cannabis use unless otherwise authorized by the office. Requirements for cannabis products. All cannabis products processed for distribution. Sorry. <laughs> for distribution for retail sale shall if in the form of an orally ingested product conform to the pot product potency limit of 10 milligrams per total THC per serving and 100 milligrams total THC per package, provided, however, that tinctures shall conform to the potency limit of 10 milligrams total THC per serving and 1,000 milligram total THC per package. So just for folks to note, you know, that means, you know, you get a, you buy a chocolate bar that has you know, cannabis in it, the highest total amount of milligrams in that chocolate bar, the entirety of it could be a hundred milligrams and the proposed dose. So like each, let's just say this chocolate is broken up into a Hershey's. Uh, we don't endorse Hershey's here, but in case it's broken into kind of that Hershey's like scenario, where you have your little mini bars, the mini bars could only have 10 milligrams per serving. Um, there's definitely a lot of debate about this. A lot of folks feel it's too low. Um, folks who are really edible consumers tend to say that they could easily handle double that amount um, or even half of that package would be their single dose. So you begin looking at like, yeah, maybe for a novice consumer, uh, 10 milligrams is a safe bet, but like limiting everybody to that dosage per like that limit per dose is definitely uh, 
has impact on those who, who their preference of consumption is eating and they tend to have a higher tolerance than someone who doesn't, isn't a regular eater. And my guess is that's really, it's not just public health. It's specifically for um, children. Like mm -hmm. should they accidentally ingest an entire chocolate bar of THC, they're only going to get a hundred milligrams as opposed to, you know, if they didn't cap it, whatever it was. So I'm willing to bet that's why OCM threw in the hundred milligrams, whether that's, you know, a valid um, number um, mm -hmm. or not. I'm, you know, I'm not debating that, but I think that that's their rationale as to why they capped it is just, we, and I think there was just a report that came out that, you know, said that children accidentally ingesting uh, cannabinoids has uh, increased since re legalization. So this is clearly top on their mind. Mm. I know that they get a lot of pushback from anti-legalization groups on these types of points. You know, what's interesting though, I'd call, I'd call foul on just that notice like the legalization of cannabis came alongside the legalization the uh the loophole of this delta eight products and delta nine being on shelves and all of that crap was marketed to children you know like it i so much of it was marketed in a way that was not legal and it wasn't even sold legally so it's just like it's i i get the concern um it's definitely a concern of mine you know if i ate too much cannabis it would definitely not be a fun trip um, so extending that to children, but so much of the stuff that's been sold in the unregulated space, even through like licensed hemp shops, but not regulated by Department of Health, um, fall in that category that I would say are, are, are really targeted to children um, and really, really high potency stuff where like you eat a bag, you eat a thousand milligrams and like that's dangerous, um, you know, for, for most people, even if it's just from a like functionality perspective, maybe not a toxicity uh, perspective. How many of those you know, otherwise illegal products were in child safe containers to begin with. Exactly. I saw a lot in just like little bags, you know what I mean? That just right. that look exactly like the candy bag that they're replicating. So it's kind of like, I get it. And we will see more of that. And, you know, as we discussed the debate between child resistant packaging, I mean, food edibles is a quick way to get a lot in your body. Um, but, you know, all the steps taken and precautioned here I think will create a very safe environment compared to other things that kids could easily have access to, you know, like the wine bottle with all you have to do is pull the cork off of it or the, the twist top handle of alcohol, you know? So it's uh, when we look at what they're putting in place um, and understand where this kind of uptick is probably coming from, uh, hopefully we're heading in a safer direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, accurately reflect testing results and not contain less than 90% or more than 110% of the concentration of total THC, CBD, or any other phytocannabinoid and terpene content as listed on the cannabis product label. Any cannabis product not meeting this requirement shall be relabeled with the accurate phytocannabinoid and terpene content, provided that all other laboratory testing results comply with part 130 of this title and the maximum serving requirements in this part without further product remediation, unless otherwise specified in the office, uh, be prepackaged and not added to food or any other consumable product at the point of sale. So you can't get around their prohibitions. You know, they don't want it sold with alcohol, so you can't sell a beer and THC and just tell the person to combine them <laughs> like, yeah. you know, once mm -hmm. they buy it. That's their thing. Not to say that you couldn't make a stop at a, you know, gas station on the way home, but they don't want that happening right there at the point of sale to specifically get around the regulations. Mm. Uh, be shelf stable unless otherwise approved in writing by the office, provided that nothing in this provision shall prohibit a processor from storing non-cannabis components or ingredients under refrigeration until use in product manufacturing contain only excipient or ingredients which are appropriate for the cannabis product type manufactured and are at minimum food grade or considered generally recognized as safe unless otherwise required by the office to be pharmaceutical grade based on product type. Have a date of expiration for unopened product and a use by date for open product established by available stability data from stability studies initiated by the licensee or from a reputable outside source for the cannabis product form. Each processor that is labeling cannabis products in their final form to be sold to consumers shall possess stability data for each cannabis product being labeled, which supports any 
unopened package date of expiration or open package use use by date on the cannabis products respective labeling and shall be made available to the office upon request. It's nice that they've put those in regs because I remember when um, the packaging labeling regs first came out, everybody was like, what's the difference between an expiration date and a use by date? And now we know it, it all deals with when it's opened. Mm -hmm. Stability testing. The processor shall complete any further stability testing of a cannabis product requested by the office to demonstrate the ongoing stability of the product produced over time. For stability testing of unopened cannabis products, each cannabis product shall retain a total THC and CBD concentration in milligrams per single serving that is consistent with paragraph two of the subdivision. If the product no longer retains a consistent concentration of total C THC and CBD pursuant to paragraph one of this subdivision, the product shall be deemed no longer suitable for sale and destroyed in accordance with part 125 of this title. Except for cannabis flower products that have the total number of servings in the cannabis product determined and displayed. For cannabis edible products or products intended for oral ingestion, products that consist of... Wait, wait, wait. Except for cannabis flower products have the total number of servings in the cannabis product determined and displayed. Thus, why would you need to have a milligram per serving on your cannabis flower packaging? Drum roll, please. <laughs> I think you should mark that. Wow. That's a, that's yeah. a comment. <laughs> so for folks who are interested in why we're so excited, um, we've been debating the need for uh, a milligram per dose requirement on the pack on smokable flower packaging. Um, nowhere else have we seen that. And it just, it seems a little bit arbitrary and um, like complicated where of course it, it's a lot simpler when you're looking at an edible, but we're, I would advocate against needing to have a per dose milligram for flower consumption uh, because it just, I don't see the value or need. I think it's a very challenging thing to do. So- I would imagine too that it like determining what a dose of flower product is is completely arbitrary. Like nobody, no two people would agree on what a single dose is. Mm. So yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> marking, uh, yeah, marking it. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> um, um, all right. right. For cannabis edible products or products intended for oral ingestion, products that consist of more than a single serving shall be either scored or otherwise delineated by the processor to indicate one serving if the cannabis product is in a solid form to accurately identify one serving. If the product is not in a solid form, the product shall be packaged in a manner such that a single serving is readily identifiable or easily measurable and the package is resealable or if the product is a cannabis beverage product, the product shall not have more than a single serving per package, provided, however, multiple bever cannabis beverage products can be sold together. I wonder if they'll cap that. Like, you know, you can buy a six pack, but you can't buy a 24 pack or, like, you know, like whatever. I don't know. Well, you're not going to get the 30 rack of <laughs> THC infused beverages. Yeah, your five mig THC light bevs. <laughs> Fast acting. The, the keystone ice of THC beverages. Yeah, it's point point one five percent. Oh Lord. If such products other than flower products contain multiple servings, which are not individually wrapped, pre-measured, separated, or delineated, must include a measuring device such as a measuring cap, cup, or dropper with the product packaging, which shall be provided with the cannabis product. Hash marks on the package shall not qualify as a measuring device. If vaporized or inhaled, meet the following additional requirements. Cannabis vaporization devices shall be a closed system with a pre-filled single-use cartridge that attaches to a rechargeable battery or a single-use product. Vaporization devices shall have internal or external temperature controls to prevent combustion and have a heat Heating element made of inert materials such as glass, ceramic, or stainless steel, and not plastic or rubber. Except for botanically derived terpenes, excipients and ingredients used in vaporized or inhaled cannabis products shall be pharmaceutical grade unless otherwise approved by the office and shall not include synthetic terpenes, polyethylene glycol, vitamin E acetate, medium chain triglycerides, medicinal compounds, 
illegal or controlled substances, artificial food coloring, benzoic acid, dye ketones, and any other compound or ingredient as determined by the office. Cannabis products cannot exceed more than 10% total terpenes, and licensees shall maintain records of all cannabis or botanically derived terpenes used in the cannabis product with full information on the source of botanically derived terpenes used and provide this information to the office upon request. Except so is that, is that a COA on your terpenes? <laughs> I mean, kind of sounds like it, right? It is interesting to think about, you know, this may get pushed back from some folks, but like botanically, so you could come from any, any process, any, any plant anywhere uh, versus like cannabis derived terpenes. Uh, it, it's just an interesting thing. Like I might, I would lean towards requesting that I'd consider like you saying, oh yeah, can this be just cannabis derived terpenes? Um, but wasn't that a big fight in hemp to allow uh, other than cannabis derived terpenes? Um, I can't remember if that was a debate and I'm sure this is a, like processors would be like, that's stupid. It's not in volume, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's just, it's an, for me, like maintaining a closed loop in the cannabis supply chain versus bringing in God knows what from where um, is, is just kind of, I guess, where I'm coming from. Except for cannabis flower products, be homogenous with phytocannabinoid content evenly distributed throughout the cannabis product. A cannabis product shall not be considered homogenous if the concentration of total THC and CBD in milligrams per serving per single serving for five samples of cannabis product lot batch submitted for testing pursuant to part 130 of this title is greater than plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean concentration for total THC and CBD in milligrams per serving for that submitted lot batch. And be identified and categorized in a processor's inventory tracking system, including but not limited to the information detailing the milligrams of total THC in the cannabis product to ensure compliance with Article 20C of the tax law. That is the THC potency tax, and maybe we'll get a late uh, holiday present and that will go. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, Cannabis product, quality plans, master manufacturing records, and batch records. A processor shall implement and maintain a written product quality plan for each type of cannabis product manufactured at the licensed premises. The product quality plan shall address the risks and hazards associated with the premises and the manufacturing process that if not properly mitigated, may cause the cannabis product to be adulterated or misbranded, or may cause the cannabis product to fail laboratory testing or quality assurance review, and shall include the following. A comprehensive assessment of the overall manufacturing process, including all steps from component intake through transfer of product from the premises, evaluation of the potential risks associated with each manufacturing step, which includes evaluation of potential risk to cannabis product quality that could be introduced during manufacturing operations, including, but not limited to, physical, biological, microbiological, or chemical hazards or process failures that may lead to product contamination, allergen cross-contact, contact, packaging errors, labeling errors, or other errors affecting cannabis product quality, and identification of preventive measures necessary to mitigate each potential risk identified, methods to evaluate the effectiveness of the preventative measure and any action to take if a preventative measure was unsuccessful. A processor should, shall develop, maintain, and follow a written master manufacturing protocol for each unique formulation of cannabis product manufactured and for each batch size to ensure uniformity in finished batches and across all batches produced. The master manufacturing protocol shall include the following. The name and intended phytocannabinoid content of the cannabis product to be manufactured, a complete list of all ingredients to be used and the weight up or measure of each ingredient, which may include the ability to adjust the weight or measure of the phytocannabinoid containing ingredients in order to account for the variability of phytocannabinoid content in the cannabis. The identity and weight or measure of each ingredient that will be declared on the ingredient list of the cannabis product, if different than above. 
the expected yield of the finished manufacturing cannabis product based on the quantity of ingredients or packaging to be used in the absence of any loss or error in actual production, and the maximum and minimum percentages of expected yield beyond which a deviation investigation of a batch will be necessary. A description of packaging and a representative label or a cross-reference to the location of the actual representative label, which may be maintained electronically. The expected number of packages and labels to be used if the cannabis product will leave the manufacturing premises in final form. Written instructions for each point, step, or stage in the manufacturing process. And written instructions for any action to mitigate risks identified in the product quality plan. Processors shall develop, maintain, and follow a written batch production record for, e for every batch of cannabis product manufactured and shall include any batch-specific remediation or relabeling. The batch production record shall accurately follow the appropriate master manufacturing protocol and each step of the protocol shall be performed in the, batch of the, in the production of the batch. Document complete information relating to the production and control of each batch, including but not limited to a lot number, a batch number, as applicable or the finished batch of cannabis product and unique identification numbers or barcodes of all the cannabis used in the batch as captured by the inventory tracking system of record. Specific equipment and processing lines used in producing or remediating the batch, the identity and weight or measure of each component used, the actual yield and the percentage difference from expected yield at appropriate phases or manufacturing as identified in the master manufacturing protocol, the actual results obtained during any monitoring operation, if the product quality plan identifies any monitoring needed to ensure product safety as a specified manufacturer or specific manufacturing step, the date and time of when each step of the manufacturing master manufacturing protocol was performed and the initials of the person performing each step, an actual or representative label or other identification of the label to be used for the cannabis product, the actual quantity of the packaging and labels used and the difference from the expected number to be used if the cannabis product will be leaving the manufacturing premises in the final cannabis full and final cannabis product documentation that quality control personnel reviewed the batch production record including all required monitoring operations testing results for components if applicable and finished batches of cannabis product and either approved and released or rejected the final cannabis product including any remediated repackaged or relabeled cannabis product documentation at the time of performance of any investigation identified in the product quality plan or master manufacturing protocol including investigations into deviations from the expected yield or package and label count Contain actual values and observations as appropriate during verification activities and be accurate and legible and be created concurrently with performance of the activity documented and include sufficient detail to provide a history of work performed, including the date each step was performed and the signature initials of the employee performing the activities. Product quality plans, master manufacturing protocols, and batch records shall be readily available for employee reference and be made readily available to the office upon request. Cannabis product testing. Prior to a cannabis product being distributed, a licensee authorized to process shall test a statistically significant number of cannabis products in accordance with the required sampling protocols as set forth in Part 130 of this title and determined by the office and maintain, and maintain a certificate of analysis for all lots of cannabis product tested for a period of five years from the date of expiration. I mean, so let's just say your date of expiration is two years after you manufacture it. So you have to technically hold that COA for seven years. Yep. Wild. Backup system. Yeah. Uh, all cannabis product testing shall be consistent with the acceptable limits as determined by the office as set forth in part 130 of this title. The licensee shall retain a subset of each lot of cannabis products to allow for testing in the future if requested by the office as follows. Retained samples shall be stored unopened as indicated on the label in accordance with part 128 of the title and in the original packaging. Retained samples shall be readily identifiable as belonging to a specific lot and the quantity retained shall be statistically shall be a statistically representative number of samples to allow for complete testing of the product at least two times and shall be retained by the processor for at least 30 days following the date of expiration or longer if directed by the office. So you're going to have to have a really big storage area. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cannabis product quarantine and remediation. 
any lot not meeting the minimum testing standards for contaminants shall be rejected and destroyed by the license processor in accordance with part 125 of this title notwithstanding a cannabis flower product lot that has not met the minimum testing standards for microbial testing in this past all remaining contaminant testing a licensed processor may remediate and repurpose cannabis flower products provided that the cannabis flower product shall be resubmitted for the laboratory testing in a manner set forth in section 123.6 j of this title after completing the required analyses of a representative sample obtained from a remediated or repurposed cannabis lot the laboratory shall report the results to the office in the manner set forth in part 130 of this title a cannabis flower product lot may only be remediated or repurposed for extraction once if the lot fails to meet minimum testing standards for contaminants after the remediation or repurposing process the entire lot shall be destroyed by the licensed processor in accordance with what part 125 of this title when failed cannabis flower product lot is not remediated or reprocessed in, a, in any way it cannot be retested any subsequent testing results produced without remediation of the failed batch will not supersede the initial regulatory testing results. Mm. And that you have it, folks, are the prohibitions, allowances, and operations allowed under the proposed regulations for processors. Um, so the next, next up will be 123.7 distributor ownership. We're going to hold off on that till next call. Just take this one chunk at a time. So if you're interested in distributor uh, business model, et cetera, stay tuned. Then we'll be, uh, there, there's a bunch more fun stuff with regards to licensees, do's and don'ts. Um, anyone have any questions who's on the call? Uh, I, we cruise through a lot and it, it's definitely complex. And if there's one takeaway from looking at this processor side of things is like, it's going to be a lot of tracking, a lot of paperwork, you know, how many times you have to check a box that are, the product is safe before it makes it to market and go through your kind of your compliance or your operations manual, your step by step, like, you know, you did everything by your book of standard operating procedure, even so granular that, you know, it's you have to check the box, whoever's doing the production has to check the box of each significant step of production to ensure that that was done. So it's a lot. It's a lot of data. It's a lot of reporting. It's not impossible, but just really important to, to recognize that. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't hear you there. I said no questions. I think everybody was bored to death by the compliance stuff. <laughs> Are you kidding me? We had so much fun. <laughs> Admittedly, uh, a little bit of a dry section, but important nonetheless. Yeah, super important. And no matter what, this is the backbone. And so anyone who's interested in a processor license, watch and repeat this five times so you're ready, so you know exactly what you're in for. That, that's really what this is here for. Obviously, we provide a critical, or at least a uh, our own analysis of what this means and how it may impact or things we may comment on. Um, but again, if, you, if you're interested in this space and that's a particular license type, like you got to know the ins and outs of that. And you could also use this to begin building out your like, your reporting fr framework, your, your, your internal SOPs, et cetera. So it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a lot of work that we can do in advance to prepare for the process flow moving forward. Yeah, of course, Stephen, thank you so much. Um, well, in the meantime, we'll be back here. Uh, so we're here Tuesday, Thursday, noon until 1, 1 15. Today, we're gonna cut off at noon um, or at 1 p.m. And yeah, thank you so much for, for your participation, your perspective, and hopefully this is something that's supporting you along the way in your decision-making and uh, entry into the New York State adult use cannabis market. Um, Jason, thank you so much for your time. Everyone on the call, thank you for being here and we'll see you on Thursday.